Greetings and salutations and thank you for clicking on this video. It's time for another Q&A video and this time around I'm actually going to answer your questions. I'm not going to be a big egotist and talk about myself like I did in the last one. I posted the last Q&A video about myself because I had gotten a lot of questions about my computer background so I figured that would be a good place to answer it. But this time around I've actually gone through the questions that you guys have posted on YouTube, Facebook, emails, things like that and I have selected a few to talk about in this video. First off before we get into that I just want to say thank you to everybody who posts your comments and questions. Uh, I get a lot and it is getting to the point where it's almost overwhelming. I cannot answer everybody's question. Fortunately, the community that has grown up around the Easy Linux project, a lot of folks will jump in there and answer people's questions if I don't get to them, which is pretty cool. So thank you for doing that. I do try and read everything, but I don't necessarily have time to respond to everything. But I just want you to know that uh, I'm very appreciative of your questions. So let's get to the first one here. It says, Hi Joe, Easy Linux. I have been watching your YouTube videos for the past couple of months and I am very much delighted to watch more. In a couple of videos I see that you have mentioned that install Linux on a hard drive and swap the hard drive into different computer to boot off of it. Is this really possible? I am a little confused as to how this works. If you do that way, where will you install the bootloader and does the bootloader on the computer where the hard drive is plugged in, does it automatically boot the OS off the hard drive? If it is easy to do so, could you please post a video on how to achieve this? And it is signed Balaji. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Well, yes, you can take a hard drive that has Linux installed on it from one computer and put it into another. But there are several conditions that have to be met first and it is uh, can be a little bit tricky. I've done it many, many times. I know that there are videos on YouTube where people say you can't do it and then they'll they'll demonstrate and they'll try and do it and it won't work and that's because they don't know what they're doing number one and number two uh, they're not doing it correctly <laughs> so that's the problem there first of all I don't know whether this works with a UEFI formatted drive so if you have a UEFI boot loader or a, a boot sector on your drive I've never actually tried to swap it from one machine to the next, so I don't know if that works. I do know it works if you use just the old MS-DOS MBR where the bootloader is installed on the front of the drive, and that works. Uh, I've done that many, many times, so that is one thing to keep in mind. Second of all, the, the installation of Linux that you're going to try and move from one machine to the next can't have any proprietary drivers installed so if you have proprietary drivers for video especially like the machine that you want to take the drive out of and then put into another machine has an NVIDIA card you've installed the drivers for that NVIDIA card chances are if you put it in another machine that doesn't have the exact same card in it what's going to happen is those drivers are going to crash on boot so it will try and boot and then as soon as it loads it it'll just stop and it'll throw up an error message all is not lost though I mean you can boot into a recovery console which is available in the grub menu and then you could manually uninstall those drivers and then if you get rid of the drivers it probably will boot but what I do is just make sure that I don't install any proprietary drivers if I'm going to move from one machine to the next as a matter of fact I have one computer that I played with for a while that did not have a functioning DVD drive it would not boot off of USB it was an old machine and the only way that I could get a Linux distribution into that machine was to install it on another computer plug a hard drive into this other computer install Linux on it get it set up you know with a basic install no proprietary anything and then take that drive out of the machine and then put it in the other machine boot it up and then continue setting it up. It was the only way to do it, so it's definitely possible. It is also definitely possible to uh, save your laptop if, like for instance, you have Linux installed on a laptop, you drop the laptop, you break the screen, you don't want to get it fixed, you're tired and done with it, so you get another laptop. As long as proprietary drivers are not installed, you should be able to take that hard drive out, put it in the next machine, and boot it up. Don't count on being able to do this, though, because there ain't no guarantees. 
I mean, you may end up with an unstable Linux system. The hardware might be so different that there's a conflict or something like that. But yes, you can do it. I prefer not to do it if I can help it because, like I said, it's always best to have a fresh install on the machine in on which you intend to run Linux. But if you like build computers or something like that, you can always do cool things like set it up on one image and then just clone a bunch of hard drives and then you don't have to do anything but pop a hard drive in and boot it up. Now to answer the question about bootloaders, I'm going to get into this just a little bit. The way it works is this, I mean, at least for the old master boot record method, I'm not a big fan nor am I an expert with how UEFI works and I really try and avoid that technology as much as possible. But the way it works with MBR is, is that the computer's BIOS, the basic input outsets output system designates a drive that is going to be the boot drive so that's when you set up your boot order that's what you're doing you might tell the machine to look off of a, like a DVD or a USB stick first and then go to the hard drive but there is a hard drive in that machine or a partition on a hard drive that is set as the bootloader and or the the boot drive and that's where the operating system that's where the machine expects it to be so what the BIOS does is it looks for a bootloader installed on the front of that hard drive. Bootloaders are not installed in the partitions with the operating system. They are actually installed on the drive itself. There's a special reserve space right at the front of the drive and you have this tiny little bit of data in there that basically tells the system, hey the OS is here so the BIOS looks for a bootloader, it reads the bootloader, and then the bootloader itself gets loaded into memory, and then it triggers other programs. So in the case of Linux, we use the Grub or Grand Unified Bootloader, and then the Grub, little tiny program that runs on the computer before it actually starts the operating system, then you can choose the operating system if you have more than one, and it, it starts the process of booting. So that's how that works. The bootloader lives on the hard drive. So as long as there are no con hardware conflicts and you can take that drive out and put it in another machine. Linux is the only operating system that you can pull that off with. If you tried to do that with Windows, it would not work, it would not boot. There are a lot of uh, things in Windows that kind of lock the hard drive to the computer. We're even talking about old Windows. It, it just doesn't work. Now I don't know whether it worked back in the Windows 98 days. I never tried to do it, but it probably would have, but it would all depend on what drivers you had installed once again. Um, so, yeah, it works, but it has to be under certain conditions. And don't believe those who say it absolutely doesn't work because it does. I've done it many, 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 many times. And thank you for the question. That's a good one. So thank you very much, Balaji. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Moving on to question number two. Hey, wanted to ask, ever since I had to get a new battery, I had trouble with it. It won't charge fully. For that, I'd have to turn my laptop top off and on again. Then it won't last long, and its lifespan is shortening, I noticed. It also disconnects itself sometimes. I returned it and got a new one, and it's doing it again. The guy at the shop says it may be because I have Linux, not Windows. Is it even possible? It sounds like rubbish to me. Thanks for the answer. Well, Amy, thank you for the question. Uh, there, there are several things that could be causing this issue. First of all, the it could be the power supply to the computer. And you, you could have a bad power supply. It's not the battery itself. It's the power supply that plugs into the computer. It could also be a problem in the power controller that's built into the hardware of the computer. Okay, So if that power controller is not talking to that battery the way it should and making sure it's charged, that could be an issue. I think uh, it, it could maybe be a software issue. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm not really sure. I mean, that, that the stranger things have happened. But it sounds to me like you have a hardware issue and not a software issue going on, especially if it worked fine and then the battery suddenly, it just died and then you had to put another one on it. It may mean that something in there is zinged and it's not working properly. Uh, so therefore, I would... I would get a new power supply, first of all, and if that didn't fix the problem, then I'd look for probably another laptop. Or Those problems are really hard to troubleshoot, and somebody might charge you a lot of money and then not be able to fix it. Uh, the broader question that this brings up is power management on Linux. Some distributions are better at it than others, and it becomes a matter of finding one that 
will work well with your hardware and like Ubuntu Mate for instance has a ton of power management tools that are baked right in and it tends to work really really well and straight Ubuntu does well too uh, I can't really I don't really run computers off of batteries a whole lot I just have to get feedback from some people but it really depends on how well the uh, operating system can control the fans in the computer and the power management and all that stuff but generally speaking I've never had major issues with this. I know some people have. Uh, it, it gets into this big gray area between software and hardware at this point. But what you're describing here sounds like a hardware issue. And it could be any number of things going on in that machine. So the first thing that I would do, an external power supply, is buy another one and see if that helped. And if that didn't help, then maybe look at sending it in for repair or getting another laptop. No, I... It could maybe be Linux, but I tend to not think so if it was working fine and then you had a battery die. So there you go. That's my answer to that question. I get lots of questions all the time about power issues with laptops, and that is a, it's a sticky point. It really depends on the hardware you have. It depends on the operating system installed, which version of Linux, that sort of thing how well it talks to the hardware there's a lot of variables in there and there really aren't any hard answers and so therefore I just wanted to touch on that I really don't have hard answers about that I run my laptop machines plugged in very rarely do I ever run a laptop on a battery just simply because of the fact that I don't move them around and even if I do take them places I plug them in I don't trust batteries so and I, I have noticed on my machines that I get the, a couple of machines that I have, I get about three, four hours of battery life at the most. And it depends a great deal on what you do, how processor intensive what you're doing. If you're going to watch videos and that sucks up a lot of GPU and a lot of processing, probably going to run through batteries a lot quicker than if you're just doing text or email or something like that. But, you know, I always... People at shops, I want to say this and then I'll move on from it. I mean, you take it into a shop, the first thing they want to blame is the software. Oh, you've got the, you know, the, the software is messing up, whether that be Windows, Mac, or Linux. They always want to say it's the software first because troubleshooting these hardware issues is a pain. They don't want to mess with it, and it, it kind of frustrates me a little bit. I remember years ago when I went to work for Gateway that we had a mobile division, and this was when laptops were just starting to become a thing. And I remember the guy, I didn't work for a mobile division at all, and I remember one of my uh, instructors in a training class said, laptops suck, you take all those components, you cram them together, there's not enough, in, there's not enough circulation of air, and they tend to burn themselves up. And that's true, they get hot, they overheat, and when you overheat the circuit boards in there and the the properties the electrical properties change and things start getting a little strange and that's just kind of the nature of laptops so if you do use a laptop make sure that you have it well ventilated keep it cool because letting them to get to the point where they're really hot that can cause a lot of really strange issues to pop up so is there a bug with KDE then? I've never had a problem with XFCE. I had a couple of desktop crashes with Linux Mint 18 Cinnamon, but never had the graphical screen tearing. XFCE for me is the best desktop environment for Linux distributions, whether it be Linux Mint, Ubuntu, or Fedora Workstation, which I'm using now. Linux has changed my life, and I'm never going back to Windows or OS X. Speaking of Fedora, have you ever used it before? Have you ever considered using open source file formats for your music videos, etc., so that you don't need the proprietary codecs that Mint and Ubuntu offer? I'm just curious and hungry for Linux answers. Well, and that is signed Stacy. So Stacy, look, I'm going to just take this one bit at a time here and we'll just go through this. I get a lot of questions like this, guys. These are almost impossible to answer in a comment because you want to give a paragraph or two to each one, you know what I mean? And unfortunately, I, I can't answer a lot of these questions like that, or at least do it, do it and give it any justice. So I figured I'd do this one here. I don't know about a bug with KDE. If you have screen tearing problems, that just may be an issue with the compositor that KDE is running not working well with your hardware. 
So I don't know. There's a lot of variables in there. Uh, if uh, XFCE works for you, then stick with it. You know what I mean? If you find something that works and you try something out and it doesn't look like something you want, that's one of the beautiful things about Linux. You can just move on to something else and you'd be surprised. Sometimes you'll, you'll be hating life. You won't like certain distributions or certain desktops and then you'll run over to another on a particular piece of hardware and it's like, oh, this is great. So I don't know whether it's a bug or whatever the deal is. It could be any number of things going on there. Let's see, XFCF, XFCE for me is the best environment for Linux distributions, whether it be Linux Mint, Ubuntu, or Fedora. I like XFCE as well. I have run that in the past, and it is a very groovy desktop environment. It does have some bugs and issues. If you try and get it to do certain things, uh, sometimes you can run into some problems and I, it's not that I dislike XFCE, it's just for what I need a computer to do right now, it's not going to work. So the one that has worked for me is Cinnamon on this particular machine, so I kind of stick with it because it I get all the settings I need. I do like KDE though, and it the, when I was using KDE Neon, that was really cool because it had those settings as well and I could tweak things up. But Cinnamon is a nice middle ground for me between being... Uh, simple enough where it's not that big a deal and complex enough where I have the control I need whereas some desktop environments they don't have the control that I want and other desktop environments they have too much you know like KDE is a bit much I mean they're so the, the settings are intricate it take you like two days to really set that thing up the way you wanted it to whereas I can set up cinnamon in about 15 minutes and it's just because I know what all the what all the settings are and what they do so that's why I'm using it right now. I do like the Mate desktop though, and I've got that running on another machine. Okay, glad to hear you're never going back to Windows or OS 10. Have I ever used Fedora? No, I have never used Fedora in a long-term situation simply because I have found it extremely difficult to get set up in the past. Fedora is a cutting-edge distro, and usually when I try it is a few days after a new release, and I'm running into bugs and issues and I can't get certain software installed getting the driver set up for Fedora can be a real pain I, I do realize that there is software out there that makes that easy there's Fetty and things like that but uh, I just I, Fedora just there's a lot of things about it that don't make it the distro for me nor can I recommend it to clients because it's just it's difficult to set up and there's not really a clear path to getting from a basic Fedora install to a fully functional desktop. I mean, if you go look for information on that, everybody's got a different way of doing that and a lot of work in the terminal to install this and this and that and the other thing. It's like, no, 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 no. I stick with the ones that are relatively easy. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Linux Lite, things like that. Have I ever considered using open source file formats for your music, videos, etc.? Well, I have a huge music collection, and it is pretty much all at this point in MP3 format because that was the format that I got the stuff in or created it in years ago. So those I pretty much leave the same. However, I have made a decision that I will no longer create anything in an MP3 format, and I will use AUG or FLAC from this point forward. I have not added anything to my music collection in quite some time. I don't consume music simply because I'm an old fogey and I like stuff that was recorded before the year 2000. I'm not a big fan of modern music and so therefore I don't really follow it. I'm just, I like old stuff. So I pretty much got everything that I want but if I am going to do a new, pro at some point I'd like to do a project where I kind of rebuild my music library or at least part of it the stuff that I have uh, from my CD collection I have a huge CD collection and like I said that was originally done in mp3 format many years ago and I also didn't do it as albums I did them as individual songs so when you look into my music collection you'll see that it's just a whole list of songs by artists and stuff like that and at the time I was working in radio and that was the most logical way to do that and really what I was trying to do was was just kind of get my music player to shuffle songs and all that other kind of stuff what I would like to do is do a more uh, 
a, a better rip, in other words, where I actually have it off into albums, which I never did before. But I may or may not do that. It depends because I've got a lot of... St- that would be a project that would have to go over. It would probably take me a year to do that. And so, therefore, I'm not sure whether I want to attempt that. I mean, I can find any song I want now. But if I do add to the collection or change anything about it, probably what I will end up doing is putting them in, like, AUG format or FLAC. I'm not going to create any more MP3s. But I have plenty of MP3s around already. And, no, I'm not a big... That's the other thing. Converting... Okay, let's say you have a bunch of MP3s and you get all full of yourself with open source and you go, I don't want to use closed source software. Now you're going to convert all that stuff. You're going to lose a lot in the conversion, especially if the source and the destination are both lossy formats. So if you have MP3 files and then you're going to convert them to AUG files, for instance, you're going to lose quality because you're recompressing compressed audio. Or, you know, there's going to be more losses. I mean, I guess if you had a really, really good decoding codec, then you could, like, store them as FLAC, which is uncompressed or lossless, and then you wouldn't lose much quality in the pro- in, in the process. But anytime you're going to convert a file from one to the next, there's a chance of adding glitches or errors or losing quality. So my strategy is just leave things exactly the way they are and... You know, MP3 play codecs, they're pretty common, no big deal. That way I can play back the files. If I'm going to add to that, then I will create something in a new format like AUG. They, they live together in harmony. So, there you go. And this is kind of an interesting question here. It says, um, as a non-Linux guy, what's the need for so many distributions? Performance differences, feature differences, or stylistic differences? I feel like a good OS should be one that is generic and can run your apps. Not sure why there needs to be a hundred variants to accomplish that goal. I'm not complaining, just uninformed. John. That is a good question. Because people that come to the Linux community, they will... Yeah, it's it's confusing. I mean, if you think about it. Because in the proprietary world of Mac and Windows, you get what they give you. I mean, sure, there are third-party applications and you can make changes and do things, but not like in Linux. It's not the same deal. Linux, everything is up for grabs. You can change anything about this system anytime that you want to. And, you know, it's like the old movie Field of Dreams where if he says, if you build it, they will come. Well, with open source, it's if you make it available, they will build it. So that's why we have so many distributions of Linux. It's because each one is somebody's vision of what an operating system should be. It's it's what they think is the best way to use the technology that's already there. Okay, Anybody can come up with a Linux distribution because you don't even have to be a programmer to do it. You don't even have to know how to hack code. It doesn't make any difference. It's all modular, so you can grab one tool from over here and one piece from over there, and you can put it together. You can come up with something on your own. And people do and some Linux distributions are made for general use like Ubuntu or Linux Mint for instance or Manjaro those are just general use Linux distributions Arch is general use but that's a little bit of a different kind of general use you kind of build your own there Uh, as other distributions of Linux are designed for special needs they're aimed at a certain kind of user so that's the difference. But what makes it a little bit easier is that to, you know, if you're coming to Linux and you're just scratching your head, why are there so many different kinds, is to understand that they are in families. So, for instance, there is the Debian Ubuntu family. Now, these are all distributions of Linux that somehow owe their beginnings to Debian. So, Ubuntu is based on Debian, then there are a lot of distributions that are based on Debian. Linux Mint is based on Debian, but not to the extent that it used to be. Linux Mint is almost developed alongside Ubuntu. So essentially what the Linux Mint folks do is they use the Ubuntu base, and then they build on top of that, and they have their own repositories and things like that. 
many distributions that you come across, and I'm talking many distributions, there's really not much to them that make them very different from what they're based on, especially Ubuntu. A lot of people come up with a cool twist on a desktop, and they throw that on top of Ubuntu, and that's it, and they call it a Linux distribution. So that is one of the reasons that I don't do a lot of reviews of things like that. I stick with the main ones like Linux Mint. Linux Mint's been around for 10 years. And Linux Mint is also available with a Debian base. It's not totally dependent on Ubuntu. That's kind of a different way of doing things and still using somebody else's work there, which is perfectly all right in the open source world. If you give them credit, that's great. Uh, but some of the Ubuntu distributions that are out there, and I'm not talking about the official flavors like Kubuntu and Lubuntu and Zubuntu, which is basically Ubuntu with a different desktop. I'm talking about them third-party dudes out there. There's not much to them. There's really not that much of a difference. And so, therefore, you know, it could be argued that there are too many Linux distributions. But on the flip side of that, you have choices. And people... It's perfectly all right to do that. It's perfectly all right to take somebody else's work and build on it and come up with something different. That's part of the fun. But if you're first coming to Linux, it can get confusing. I understand that. So what I always tell people is, you know, the ones that most newbies start out with, first of all, you want a distribution that's easy to use and you want one with lots of support. And the two that are probably the best supported out there, period, are Linux Mint and Ubuntu as far as finding answers and then you know like arch is well supported they have a pretty uh, really nice documentation but arch is very difficult for a newbie to get into because there's really not a super easy installer and it's just the nature of the uh, the the operating system one more thing to say about that you can think of linux mint as being a station wagon and Arch Linux as being a sports car. And I, there's many different styles and types of cars from different brands and things like that, but they all have one thing in common. They have a motor and four wheels. But they can be very different. Same thing goes for Linux. And Linux, all of them have a Linux kernel, and they have the same basic Linux tools necessary to run a computer. And then from that point forward, is when they get different, you know, desktops, tools, and stuff like that. It is what it is, man. It's the beautiful Linux ecosystem. I've rambled on enough about that now. Next question. Windows XP hasn't had a security update since 2014. Well, I mean, maybe it's because it doesn't need a security update. I mean, if the code is fine, then there isn't a reason to touch it. I'm not saying that that's the case, but that's something you probably should have covered. This and uh, the fellow who posted this, or fellow or female, I'm not really sure here. Sequez? It's a neat name. Um, well, first of all, when you're dealing with internet facing applications, anything that gets on the internet, that's a browser, an email client, an SSH server, anything that faces the, the big bad world out there, it needs constant updating all the time. The software world is not static. You don't come up with something and go, okay, that works, now leave it alone and never change it. Because that piece of software may function perfectly, but the world around it is going to change. So if you have a machine and you want to run Windows XP on it and you cut it off from the world, then there's no issue. You can run it till the end of time. But if that machine can get on the internet, there are components in that operating system that need to be constantly updated by maintainers and developers because the threats are always changing. It is you know, you don't get it perfect and then just keep it there and say, okay, it's fine. People are always out there, the crackers, not the hackers. Hackers are good guys, okay? Crackers are bad guys. Crackers are trying to get into your system and they're trying to screw up your life and get your information and give you ransomware and things like that. These are the malware and junkware people and people who try and 
crack somebody's system. A hacker, on the other hand, he's a good guy. He's a great software developer who comes up with new ways of doing things. Just keep that in mind. So even I slip sometime and say, hey, your machine got hacked. But let's just get that straight right off the bat. But anyway, there are people out there who are constantly looking for some way that they can take advantage of vulnerabilities in unpatched programs that are on the internet that they're looking for a way to get in. So if you are running a machine, any machine, Linux, Mac, or Windows XP, doesn't make any difference, and you're not allowing that machine to be updated, you are opening yourself up to all kinds of vulnerabilities because that's what these crackers are looking for. That's what they're looking for. They're looking at a system. They want to find somebody who isn't paying attention and they go, oh, look, man, they have got the old version of this component and I know a way to use this component to get into their system. Like, like could be your flash player, could be your email client, it could be something down in the system that you don't even know about, but they're, they're going to find a way to get in. So the best defense is to actually just keep your machine up to date. In the case of Windows XP, it has not had an official update from Microsoft since 2014. As far as Microsoft is concerned, this is dead. They are not going to be sending you any more updates. So therefore, that means this machine is two years out of date, which means that the, the crackers out there have been able to bang on this thing for two years with nobody paying attention to it, and now they know all of the vulnerabilities. This is low-hanging fruit for these guys. They can come by and get into your system, steal your personal information, and mess up your life. So this is why it is not a good idea to ever run any internet-facing operating system that is not properly patched. It should have all of the vulnerabilities closed. And don't kid yourself into thinking that, well, I can still get support for antivirus for XP. That does not keep you safe because antivirus is not going to update the infrastructure of the OS. It's not going to do it. And so, therefore, uh, there's just no way that a third-party company can anticipate and meet all of the threats that are going to be lobbed at Windows XP can't do it this is something that Microsoft themselves would have to do they would have because because of their proprietary structure they are the only ones that are allowed to actually update and modify that system that's in the EULA agreement so any third-party software you put on the machine that would violate the EULA agreement number one I wouldn't trust it and number two uh, it's it's just not gonna be able to do it gang sorry Windows XP is dead it's gone it was fun I liked Windows XP I ran Windows XP for 10 years it was a nice operating system it was like a sieve it was vulnerable because people were always getting viruses on it but the operating system itself was cool but it's over and as far as I'm concerned my own personal opinion here the days of running Windows are over too it's just too vulnerable there's too much spyware in it. There's the whole antivirus scam thing going on. Uh, you know, they, they, okay, so you have an operating system and then you are allowing third parties to build software for it that is supposedly having to keep it safe because you can't keep it safe yourself. And you are allowing that to go on so now there is a billion dollar industry that is built on providing applications that supposedly protect a system that is vulnerable to the point where it needs a third party to actually build software to protect it do you see where i'm going with that there that whole scheme that makes no sense to me at all why does that even exist so therefore i'm completely done with windows altogether but if you are running Windows, one of the things that you can do is to make sure that it is getting all of the security updates. And Microsoft right now wants to make that situation where it basically is like this. They want everybody to update to Windows 10. They don't want anybody running Windows 7 or Windows 8 
or any of the older systems. They want everybody on 10. And so therefore, to properly update a system, you would have to go to Windows 10. Windows 10 is a nightmare for some people. It works fine for some, works horribly for others. Anyway, that's a whole ball of, big ball of wax right there. And I'm totally done with the Microsoft ecosystem. And I don't want anything to do with it myself. So that's why I said in the video that this comes from, this was in the uh, Mr. Desktop and Mr. Server video that I was talking about this. If you know somebody who's running Windows XP, you really need to get them off of it because it's just like low-hanging fruit for any cracker that would come along and anybody, any malicious person trying to get into the system on the internet, they go, oh, Windows XP, hold on. Let me look at my list of hacks to get in there. Okay, but, but, but here's a crack, here's a crack, here's a crack. Let's try all of these and see what we can get. So anyway, I think that's the last question here because I have rambled on quite a bit. And I do do a lot of rambling in these videos, but that's what a question and answer video is about, right? So thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. And I love your comments. and Love to hear your suggestions and things like that. Keep them coming. And I guess we'll do this again in about another month. Be sure and check out Easy Linux on the web. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook. And also check out FreedomPenguin.com for lots of great information about Linux. Talk to you again soon.